is just hold them up like that. So I'll go over a few things. Let Brother Josh chime in real quick when I finish. I'm just going to go over the format as far as what the brothers will be bringing out within the first round and the second round. Let's see here. The first round, both sides to be able to demonstrate. Both of them will have 15 minutes to bring forth the opening statement. So both sides want to be able to come with a 15-minute opening. Then there's going to be a rebuttal of 10 minutes from each side, which will be the second round. Then you'll have a second rebuttal of five minutes each. After the five-minute rebuttal round, they'll go into a cross-examination where each side gets to pose questions for 10 minutes. After each side gets to pose a question for 10 minutes, there'll be a closing of five minutes in regards to the, the uh, concluding argument and saying what they believe they brought, demonstrate their position. Then after that, It'll be a five, it'll actually be a five question QA from the audience where if anyone does want to come up and pose questions, I decide the max will be five. Because I know Brother did let me know as far as you know a certain time constraints. So it'll, the max will be five questions posed towards each side from the audience. And then that'll conclude the debate. So uh, if, before we do anything else, Brother Josh or any other minds on either side, is there anything anybody wants to get any clarity on? Anything anybody, you know? Once we get some, you know, further understanding on. Uh, yes, just to let everything be known, just a friendly reminder, we're going to turn off the chat when the debate starts. Also, any question during a cross-examination that is asked, if it's a yes or no question, you must respond with a yes or a no before you elaborate. Say yes or no first. Do not elaborate first and then say yes or no. Say yes or no and then elaborate. Also, when you are being cross-examined, when you are the one being questioned, you are not allowed to ask any questions. Now, if you ask a rhetorical question and we can tell it's a rhetorical question, we're not going to jump down your throat behind that because we'll be able to judge from the context. But if, if it looks like you're trying to ask a legitimate question while it's your turn to be questioned, we're going to remind you that you cannot do that. Also, there will be no ordering with the mods. You can question what we're saying, but you cannot argue with it, argue with any mod on any side. What we say is final. If you cannot accept that, you will be disqualified. But that's it. For me, anyway. Anyone else need any clarity on our side? As far as when I say our side, I'm talking about the brother James side or even from the brother Garden side. Uh, Wisdom, Demetrius, and Josephus, is either one of you willing to take as far as the time form in this first round of 15 minutes? We I don't we don't have a problem doing it, but I just know brothers like to be fair and make sure that they're getting an adequate time. Any of you all able to take the 15 minute timer for them? Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm going to be taking the time and I, I'm going to be giving them a, a two minute warning as well. Okay. Uh, all right, that's fair. So, brother, where's I'm going to be covering your time, Garden? You know, he's going to set you up with 15 minutes, and he's going to be letting you know when you get down to a two-minute warning. That's all right? Uh, yes, sir. All right, so whenever you start, brother Garden, that's when, you know, he'll start the time. You can take off. All right, so now we're talking about whether are not the locusts inside of Revelation chapter 9 are going to be the Roman army or demons. So now, this is all dealing with encompass inside of the book of Revelation. So certain things you have to understand about Revelation uh, before we go into Revelation chapter 9, which is it's the revelation of Jesus Christ, the unbuilding. John bear record to the testimony of Jesus Christ. The testimony of Jesus itself is the spirit of prophecy. So this is going to be dealing with prophecy. The time of the prophecy, according to Revelation chapter 1, was at hand. And the point was to show the service, the things which must shortly take place. So now, according to Deuteronomy 18.22, when a prophet speaketh things in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord had not spoken but the prophet has spoken it presumptuously, 
thou shalt not be afraid of him. So in other words, if Christ is speaking a prophecy and he says the things were at hand and the things do not follow nor come to pass, he's not a prophet that you should be afraid of and that would make him a false prophet. That's one thing when understanding the book of Revelation. The second thing when understanding the book of Revelation is actually found in the book, Revelation 15 and 3. This is what it says. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. So, if you're going through the book of Revelation, you have to understand it is the song of Moses being personified through symbolism and etc. Uh, so that's what it's about. It's the song of Moses. It's the curses of Deuteronomy. And I'm going to actually demonstrate that. So now, this is what the song of Moses says. Uh, Deuteronomy 31 and 17, uh, found in Torah, it says, Then my anger shall be kindled against them in that day, and I will forsake them, and I will hide my face from them, and they shall be devoured, and many evils and troubles shall befall them, so that they will say in that day, Are not these evil come upon us? Because our God is not among us. Deuteronomy 31 and 19. Now, therefore, write ye this song for you and teach it to the children of Israel. Put it in their mouths that this song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. Now, uh, Torah is going to give the time period in which the song of Moses is supposed to cover. Deuteronomy 31, 29. For I know that after my death, you would utterly corrupt yourselves and turn aside from the way which I commanded you. And evil will befall you in the latter days because you will do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger through the works of your hands. That word latter right there, H319, it is pronounced Acharis, or Acharis, and it means the last or end. So in other words, the book of Revelation is set in the last days. The song of Moses is set in the last days. So when in Revelation they're singing the song of Moses, it's because the things of the song of Moses is set within that proximity of the last days. So if you want to understand the book of Revelation, you have to understand Torah. So now we're going to go to Torah around the Song of Moses, and I'm going to show you what's going on in Revelation chapter 9. So this is Deuteronomy 32, 39 from the ESV. It says, See now that I, even I am he, and there is no God beside me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. So now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to read from the Targums, right? The Targums is going to be, let me give you the exact Targums I'm going to be reading from. It's going to be the Aramaic and Palestinian Targums. So now, if you know what a Targum is, or if you don't, I'm still going to give the, the defini the, a definition according to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary 2023. It is an Aramaic translation, which scholars say that's the language that Christ spoke. It is an Aramaic translation or a paraphrase of the portion of the Old Testament. So in other words, it's their commentary on what these verses mean. We didn't get the commentary in our Bible, but there are targums that actually give the ancient commentary on what these meant to those people at that time. So now, Deuteronomy 32, 39, from that targum, it says, When the word of the Lord shall reveal himself to redeem his people, he will say to all the nations, Behold, now, that I am he who am and was and will be, and there was no other God beside me. This is when the word of the Lord, he's saying this, when he shall reveal himself. The word is the Messiah, it's Christ. So it says, I am my word kill and make alive. I smite the people of Beth Israel, and I will heal them at the end of the days, and there will be none that can deliver them, the children of Israel, Beth Israel, from my hand, God and his armies, whom I have permitted to make war against them. So according to the Targums, the armies of God was going to come against Israel. Not 
no demon armies. They don't say anything about no demon armies coming in the targums. It's all against Israel. That's why they're singing the song of Moses. So now let's go to Re uh, Revelation 20 and 8. Out of the KJV, it says, And shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to the number, sorry, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. So according to, to the Targums, the word was going to let God come against Israel to make war against them. In Revelation 20 and 8, God and Magog is coming against uh, the people who's considered the number, the sand of the sea, the number of whom is of the sand of the sea, which we know that was something spoken of about Israel. So they're both saying the same thing. At the end, God was going to come against them. So now let's get into something real interesting. Deuteronomy 32, 24 from the ESV. It says, and they shall be wasted with hunger. Remember, this is the song of Moses. And they shall be wasted with hunger and devoured by plague and poisonous pestilence. I will send the teeth of beasts against them with the venom of things that crawl in the dust. So according to the song of Moses, in the last days, the teeth of beasts will come against Israel. So now, this is Deuteronomy 32, 42. And I will make my arrows from ESV, sorry. I will make my arrows drunk with blood and my sword to devour flesh with the blood of the slain and the captives from the long hair heads of the enemies. From the long hair heads of the enemies. Remember that. Revelation 9 and 7. And so this is Revelation 9 and 7 now. In appearance, the locusts were like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were what looked like crowns of gold, and their faces were like human faces. So now, sorry about that, I skipped down too much. Let's go. Their faces was like human faces, and it says in verse 8, And they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. Now, according to the ESV, I'm going to send the long-haired enemy against them. I'm going to send the teeth of beasts against them. Revelation 9 and 8, the locust army had hair like women, a.k.a. long hair, and their teeth were like the teeth of lions, a.k.a. the teeth of beasts. So now, what Revelation 9 is doing is going through the song of Moses. It's just using symbolism. Once you look at the locusts, the locusts don't even look like locusts. The locusts look like a horse that has the head, the face of people, and it has the, the crowns on his head. It looks more like a, a, a I think it's a minotaur or a, a centaur. That's what it looks like. It looks more like a centaur if you look at ancient Greek, uh, Greek mythology. But now, we're going to go through the Targum of Jerusalem, and I'm going to explain uh, where it's going to explain what it actually meant, what they thought this meant, because it's the same imagery inside of Revelation. This is what it says, Deuteronomy 32, 24, from uh, the Targum Jerusalem. It says, I will make them go into captivity in Media and Elam, in the captivity of Babel, the house of Agag, who are like demons gaping with famine, and to corpses devoured by birds and to stricken evil spirits of the noon to linen and to spirits being with evil so it's using this as a metaphor on how these nations was against israel well look right here what it says about the teeth of beasts that was going to come against them in the last days it says and the javanese greeks who bite with their teeth like wild beasts will I send against them and will shake them by the hands of the Syrians, venomous as basilics, the serpents of the dust. So according to the Targum, the Greeks were supposed to come against Israel in the last days and bite them like teeth of wild beasts. That's what the Targum says. Now, in the one that we have, that's not the paraphrase from the, uh, the Israelites or the ancient Near Eastern. It just says teeth of beasts 
And once you go into Revelation, those teeth of beast, they're actually uh, described dealing with the locusts. So the teeth of beast is the Greeks. Once you parallel the Targums with what we have in our KJV and the book of Revelation. So now, here's something else that's interesting. Revelation 9 and 5, it says, And to them it was given that they should not kill them, that they should be, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. So John is actually telling us to look what to look for. We're looking for the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. So what did I do? I researched the scorpions in Israel. So we have the death, the death stalker scorpion. It's scorpion sting. This is the the uh what it what it does to a person, right? So it says scorpion stings are painful but mostly harmless. The sting may cause redness and swelling along with burning or stinging sensations. Symptoms related to a widespread effect of venom good and blue, breathing difficulties, muscle thrashing, unusual movement of the neck, head and eyes. Dribbling and drooling, sweating, nausea, vomiting, high blood pressure, accelerated heart rate, restlessness, excitability, or inconsolable crying, according to health.com. So now, or healthline.com. So we have the symptoms of a scorpion bite. So once you go into Deuteronomy 28, dealing with the curses, Listen to the symptoms of the curses and see do those symptoms sound like the symptoms of when a scorpion strikes a man. The Lord shall smite thee with a cons cons consumption, sorry, and with a fever, and with an inflammation, and with an extreme burning. And he's going to explain what else is going on. And with the sword. And with blasting, and with mildew, to and they morning. shall pursue me until thou perish. So now, you go to Deuteronomy, uh, well, let's skip there. Now you go to Revelation 9 and 6. And in those days, men shall seek death, and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. Deuteronomy 28, 28. The Lord shall smite thee with madness. They're looking for death. They can't find death. If anybody look for something and they can't find it, it messes with your mind. So now this is him smiting them with madness. Them actually looking for something like death and can't find it. And blindness and establishment of heart. And uh, verse 59, the Lord shall will make all these plagues wonderful and the plagues of the sea, great plagues of long continuance and sore sicknesses and of long continuance. Uh, he restated that. So now, what's going on according to the Targums mixed with the Song of Moses in Revelation? <clears throat> it's the Greek coming upon Israel, and Israel are suffering the curses. He just saying it in symbolic form. There's nothing in the curses or the Song of Moses about demons coming to do anything. It was always a foreign nation coming in that was going to bring these plagues. And the plagues that they brought in resembled the acts of a scorpion. So now, hopefully we can see now what's going on. It's just using symbolism to explain what the Roman army was going to come in and do to Israel for killing the Messiah and uh, going against that old covenant that they was in. Um, Thank y'all for listening. All right, all right. I appreciate that. That was the Brother Garden's opening round. That was his opening round. When the brother came out. I don't know if he left nothing on the table, but it's all right. That's how we're working at night. We enjoy the information. Everybody, he's going to fill us up with the information. So, now it's going to good Brother James. Uh, good Brother James, whenever you're ready, let me know. Who will be holding up Brother James' time? Because we got Twan, we got Brother Josh, and we got the... The same guy. I trust him to all take care of James' times too, or Antoine could do it. Yeah, I'll keep, I'll keep the time also. You got him? Okay, well, we got it too. So you got Brother James, whenever you start, uh, we're going to start your time, and you're going to get a two-minute warning. So you go ahead. 
All right, y'all. Peace, peace, everybody. First and foremost, I want to give all praises to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want to thank everybody for coming out. Thank the uh, Brother Dre for setting this up. Thank the, uh, my opponent for showing up. And um, let's get this thing started. So, uh, you know, I thought Revelation was hard to understand in and of itself. But that breakdown, brother, that breakdown has got has got. To, to the symbolism you added a lot of symbolism in there you got one thing right with moses and the, and dealing with moses and the song of moses the reason why they're singing the song of moses is because y'all need to pay attention when we, when you're reading revelation we're dealing with a second exodus i just want everybody to keep that in mind when we uh when i break down this breakdown for you and i'll get this thing started you know in revelation 9 i'm gonna go ahead and read the first verse but we're gonna make this real simple and we're gonna establish what the bottom of this pit is so in Revelation 9, we pick it up, we're dealing with the fifth angel sounding a trumpet. So we got the fifth trumpet, which is also known as the first woe. And it's Revelation 9 and 1. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star falling from heaven to the earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit. And what I'm going to do to identify what this bottomless pit is, I'm going to roll on over to Revelation 20. And I'm going to read Revelation 20 and verse 1. I'm going to read 1 to 3. Revelation 20 and 1, then I saw an angel, and this is going to be in reverse, when you when you see Revelation 9, they're, they're being led out of this of this prison that we're about to read about, and Revelation 20 is just in reverse, somebody getting locked up. So re- again, Revelation 20 and 1, then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who was the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should not deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. And I'm going to scroll on down to identify what this place is called again. uh, Verse 7. And verse 7 says, now when a thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from this prison, from his prison. I'm sorry. So the bottomless pit is a prison where Satan is locked up in Revelation 20. So we have a spiritual being being locked up and chained, chains of darkness being locked up in Revelation 20, uh, verse 7. So the bottomless pit is a spiritual prison. And I'm going to show you from the context of the New Testament and other exodemical books, because the Bible, you know, it identifies this in the New Testament, but there's a there's a, a, a lot more information in some of the extra biblical books that I get into. But let's get this let's get going over to Luke. Uh, let's do Luke chapter eight, and I'm gonna read verse uh, 26 through 31, and it says they they sailed to the country of the Gadarenes, which is opposite Galilee. And when he stepped out on the land, there met him a certain man from the city who had demons for a long time, and he wore no clothes, nor did he live in a house. But in the tombs, when he saw Jesus, he cried out, fell down before him, and with a loud voice said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, do not torment me. What is this demon talking about here? Torment me. We'll read further. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for it had often seized him, and he was kept under guard, bound with chains and shackles, and he broke the bonds and was driven by the demon into the wilderness. Jesus asked him, saying, What is your name? And he said legion because many demons had entered him. So now we, we find out another thing about demons. There could be many, multiple, even legions of demons in one person. And they begged him that he would not command them to go out into the abyss. This is also translated deep. And uh, in this, this word abyss in the Greek is the same Greek word that is Revelation 9 and 1 that is translated bottomless pit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over to Revelation 9, 1 again, and uh, pull up the uh, concordance here. Look up this word, abyss, is translated, a bottomless pit here is translated abusos. And that is a number 12 in the Greek, Strong's Concordance. And the definitions it gives me here, uh, and the proper application would be a special, let me see here, both as the common receptacle of the dead, and especially as the abode of demons. All righty. So now I'm going to move over and uh, establish this again in Matthew chapter 8 to establish what is in the bottomless pit. And it says, uh, Matthew 28, I'm sorry, Matthew 8 and 28. When he had come to the other side, to the country of the 
Gergesene. So this is another account of Luke chapter 8. It says again, when he, when he had come, this is Jesus, the other side to the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two demon-possessed men coming out of the tombs, exceedingly fierce, so that no one could pass that way. And suddenly they cried out, saying, What have we to do with you, Jesus, son of, the, son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? So we got a little bit more evidence of here. These demons, first of all, they don't want to be cast into this bottomless pit, which is also known as chains of darkness, lowest part of Sheol. Hades, Tartarus, you know, just like a, a, a prison cell that houses uh, corporal spirits, that's spirits that have a body, because these demons don't have a body, they're incorporeal, but just like our, our prisons, you know, for our for, for human beings, they actually have this place called the hole within the prison, you know, where people that get locked down that are unruly and, and, and need a little bit extra confinement for whatever reason, so I just wanted to bring that out. Uh, let's go on over, touch on Luke. Let's go to Luke 16. So Luke 16, we're dealing, we're going to establish in the New Testament that Jesus has given a parable here about uh, Sheol, Hades, hell, whatever you want to call it. They're all synonymous with the same thing. So here in, um, here in Luke chapter 16, we'll read verse 19 through 24. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day, but there... But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. More when the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments, so here we go, the torments in Hades, hell, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Now, we understand this is a parable, but if you, if anybody's ever looked at the book of Enoch, he is drawing from the book of Enoch right here. And I'll go there uh, in a little bit and, and touch on the book of Enoch. But here we have, it seems like there's a separation in this shield, this place of the dead, the abyss, uh, the abode of the dead. Uh, we have a separation. We have a side that's a little bit more pleasant than the other. And um, again, this is this is this is com this is being compared to there, this is a place of the dead where you have a lower part. It also shows you that the rich man was looking up at Lazarus. Hence, the bottomless pit is lower. Um, and so we're going to deal with uh, with the context of Luke uh, chapter eight. We could establish that these demons are some of them are free. And we see that uh, the demon in asking him, have you come to torment us before for the time you're requesting that Jesus, please don't cast them into the abyss. Then we, we need to figure out what's going on with the, with the rest of the demons. And so I'll go touch on Jubilees. Chapter 10 is an extra biblical book. And I'm going to read verse 1 through 11. This is Jubilees 10, verse 1. And in the third week of this Jubilee, the unclean demons began to lead astray the children of the sons of Noah, and to make to err and destroy them. And the sons of Noah came to Noah, their father, and they told him concerning the demons, which were leading astray and binding and slaying his son's sons. And he prayed before Yahweh, his sovereign ruler, and said, Yahweh of the spirits of all flesh, who have shown mercy unto me and have saved me and my sons from the waters of the flood and have not caused me to perish as you did the sons of perdition. For you... For your free, unmerited pardon has been great towards me, and great has been your mercy to my soul. Let your free, unmerited pardon be lift up upon my sons, and let my and let not wicked spirits rule over them, lest they should destroy them from the earth. But you bless me and my but you but do you bless me and my sons that we may increase and multiply and replenish the earth? And you know your watchers, the fathers of these spirits, acting in my day. And as for these spirits which are living, imprison them and hold them fast in the place of condemnation and let them not bring destruction on the sons of your servant, my sovereign ruler, for these are malignant and created in order to destroy. And uh, we'll touch on Revelation later when we have this king is given Ab Abaddon, which is the destroyer. So here you have a reference to them destroying. And, uh, and let them not rule over the spirits of the living, for you alone can exercise dominion over them and let them not have power over the sons of the righteous, for henceforth and, and forevermore. So, so Noah is, is, is uh, sending up a prayer to, and asking God to uh, 
to remove these evil spirits from his uh, from his offspring, he's noticed that uh, on the other side of the flood that they're running into a lot of uh, situations. And he's blaming it on these uh, evil spirits. And Yahweh, our sovereign ruler, made us to bind all. And the chief of the spirits, Mastema, came and said, Yahweh, creator, let some of them remain before me. So you have this chief of these evil spirits, Mastema, requesting that God leave some to remain before him. And let them listen to my voice and do all that I shall say unto them. For if some of them are not let, left to me, I shall not be able to execute the power of my will on the sons of men. For these are for corruption and leading astray before my judgment and for great men. And he said before him so that the command to the angels that were locking up these evil spirits was given to let a tenth of these evil spirits or demons remain before him and let nine parts, which is 90 percent, descend into the place of condemnation, the abyss or bottomless pit. And one of us, he commanded that we should teach Noah all their medicines for he knew that they would not walk in uprightness nor strive in righteousness. And we did according to all his words and all the malignant evil ones we bound at the place of condemnation, bottomless pit. And, that, and a tenth part of them we left that they might be subject for Satan on earth. All right, I'm going to go on over to Enoch. So right, so in that description you see, um, and one of the, when you're reading Revelation 9 and it's, it's, it's describing these locusts coming out of the bottomless pit, locusts all throughout the Bible is used as innumerable. Uh, you can read this in several places. Uh, Jeremiah, let me touch on Jeremiah real quick. Jeremiah 31, 32. So just, for, just to give an example real quick, Jeremiah, uh, let's do uh, Jeremiah 46 and 23. They shall cut down her forest, says the Lord, though it cannot be searched because they are more than the grasshoppers and are innumerable. And again, Judges 6 5. For the Midianites came with their livestock and their tents like a great swarm of locusts. So here it's just comparing the Midianites and their livestock and the, and the, the men with them to a swarm of locusts. And the camels were innumerable and they entered into the land. This is all over the place. The, the locusts are always used as a metaphor for something that can't be numbered. And when you're dealing with uh, the demons, according to Jubilees uh, chapter 10, we can see that, you know, all the all the problems with the world today, with, the, with only 10% amount of the demons allowed to roam around and affect mankind, you see all the problems that we have today. Can you imagine what would happen with, if 90% were let out of this bottomless pit? Now I'm going over to Enoch, uh, dealing with these demons again, just to touch on Enoch. Let's go to Enoch chapter 15. Give you a little backstory on some of the demons. This is Enoch chapter 15. I'll read verse 1 through, that's 1 through 12. And he, answered and, said to me, and he answered and said to me, I heard his voice. Fear not, Enoch, thou righteous man and scribe of righteousness. Approach hither and hear my voice and go, say to the watchers of heaven who have sent forth sent thee to intercede for them you should intercede for men and not for not men for you wherefore have you left the high holy and eternal heaven and lain with women and defiled yourselves with the daughters of men and taken to yourself wives with unlike the children of earth and begotten begotten giants as your sons and though you were holy spiritual living in eternal life you have defiled yourselves with the blood of women and have begotten children with the blood of flesh and as the children of men have lusted after flesh and blood as those also do who die and perish. Therefore have I given them wives also that they might impregnate them and begat children by them, that thus nothing might be wanting to them on earth, but you were formerly spiritual, living in the eternal life and immortal and immortal for all generations of the world. And therefore I have not appointed wives for you as for the spiritual ones of heaven, and heaven is their dwelling. And now the giants, these are the demons, or these are the before I'm finished reading, who are produced from the spirits and flesh shall be evil spirits on the earth and on the earth shall be the dwelling evil spirits have proceeded from their bodies because they are born from the men this is the genesis 6 account and from the holy watchers is their beginning in the primal origin they shall be evil spirits on the earth evil spirits shall they be called as for the spirits of heaven and heaven shall be their dwelling but as for the spirits on earth which were born upon the earth the demons on the earth shall be their dwelling and the spirits of the giants, and this is what one thing the demons do, the disembodied spirits of the giants, they afflict, oppress, destroy, attack, do battle and work destruction on the earth and cause trouble. They take no food, but nevertheless hunger. 
and thirst. And, and and this is one of the other reasons why the locust is used as a metaphor for these demons. If you go read up on locusts and their swarms, they are insatiable. So, they will eat everything in sight. Peace, that's all I got. I'll yield. All right, all right. I appreciate that. Appreciate that. That was Brother James open around in 15 minutes. Nobody left nothing on the table, man. You know, nobody left nothing on the table, left nothing behind. So what we're about to do, we're about to take up in the next rebuttal round. It's going to be 10 minutes each. For the garden, you got the floor. Uh, whenever you start, your timekeepers and others will, you know, start your time just to, take, just to make sure, you know, you get your adequate amount of time. Whenever you're ready, garden, you take the floor. Brother Gardner, you, you, you there? You hear me? Because if you're speaking, you might not have unmuted yourself. You might still be. You might. Oh uh, yeah, I was, in, I was trying to go. make sure. I was trying to make sure I didn't leave nothing out before my time got started. No, no problem. No problem. Just as soon as the brother start, your time will start with the garden. This is the rebuttal round as well. This is the first rebuttal round. With Ten minutes to each contestant. So brother Gardner will start first. And as soon as he start, we'll start your time, good sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, so first, um, uh, I didn't hear nothing proving that the locusts and Revelation was actually demons. So now I'm gonna keep continue. I'm gonna actually rebuttal the things that he brought out. So Revelation nine and two, and he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air was darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. Verse three, and there came out of the smoke, not the pit. The smoke, the smoke came out of the pit, and then the locusts came out of the smoke. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given powers as the scorpions of the earth have power. And I explained what that meant uh, using the Song of Moses, because that's what's going on in the book of Revelation. So now, verse 5, and to them was given that they should not kill them, but they should be tormented five months. And their torment was the torment of a scorpion when he strike a man. There's a reason why words are in the book of Revelation. Like five months? I'm going to see if we can make it there real fast. So now, first of all, I want to go to that word bottomless in Revelation 9 and 2. Uh, the G12 that he went to, which is what, Abusus or a rent abyss. In the Septuagint, that same abyss or G12 is used. But it's used in Genesis chapter 1, verse number 2. This is what Genesis 1 and 2 states. It says, The earth was invisible and unfinished, and darkness was over the deep. The word deep right there is the same word bottomless. Darkness was over the bottomless, and the, the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. Notice you have water with bottomless, in Genesis 1 and 2, where the word bottomless is. So once you go to Genesis 7 and 11, which is another place that word bottomless is used in the Septuagint, I'm going to go to Genesis 7 and 11. This is what it states. It says, In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep, the word is bottomless right there. All the fountains of the great bottomless were broken open, or broken up, and the floodgates of heaven were open. So now, what I'm trying to show you is how they actually use bottomless or abyss with things pertaining to water. So I'm, it's going to make sense in a minute. So once you go to Revelation 9 and 2, he said, and he opened the bottomless abyss, and then you got the word pit, which is G- 54, 20, G54, 42. It means cistern, right? It means cistern. What does cistern do? It carries water. So now, what you want to look at, uh, another place that is used, we're going to go to John 4. Let's go to John 4 and verse number 12. John 4 and 12. This is what it, it states here. Are thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, which is G5442, pit, 
cistern, which gave us the cistern, the well is deep from which he has dealt that living water. So he's they're using things pertaining to water. Water, judgment, locusts coming out for judgment. Locusts coming out of water to do judgment. Let's continue to show a little bit more. And you can find that uh, that came in uh, Thayer Lexicon in the Liddell Sky Greek English Lexicon, Oxford, 1968. So let me show you. Oh, yeah. He went to Enoch. So once I go to Enoch, first Enoch 54, I'm going to read five. And he said unto me, these are being prepared for the host of Azazel, so that they may take them and cast them into the abyss of complete condemnation, and they should cover their jaws with rough stones as the Lord of Spirits commanded. But he uses that information to teach maybe a demon thing. But once you go to verse 1, Enoch already explains what the allegorical meaning of Azazel out of that is. This is verse 1. And I looked and turned to another part of the earth and saw there was a deep valley with burning fire. And they wrought the kings and the mighty and began to cast them in the deep valley. This verse 2. Verse 5 said, these are prepared for the host of Azazel that they may be cast into the abyss. And guess what happens in verse 9? In those days shall punishment come from the Lord of Spirits. He will open all the chambers of waters which are above the heaven and open the chambers of the fountains which are in the earth beneath. So even there they're using abyss with the flood narrative, with a judgment. So now, let's continue on with this flood narrative. So once you go to Genesis 7, because we're talking about bottomless and cisterns and why these locusts came out of this water, this watery place, and we're going to see if they're demons or not. So once you go to Genesis 7, 24, this is what it states. And the waters prevailed upon the earth 150 days. You go to Genesis 8, verse number 3. And the waters returned from off the earth continually, and after the end of 150 days, the waters were abated. What is the significance of 150 days? That equals five months. So the flood was dealing with a five-month period in which a judgment was occurring. 150 days, the waters prevailed, the waters prevailed five months. So now, you now look at what Daniel Let's go to Daniel. You go to Daniel chapter 9. Try to hurry and get there before I run out of time. You go to Daniel chapter 9. This is what Daniel 9 26 says. Daniel 9 26 says, And after three scores and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood. And until the end of the war, desolations are determined. See, these are an army coming in, destroying the city and the sanctuary with the flood that lasted the same amount, the five months in which the flood lasted. It's just a play on that understanding. So now, let's go to Matthew 24. And, and, and I'll, uh, I should have a, uh, one more minute left. I got two minutes left. Matthew 24. Minutes oh, okay, bet, 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 bet. Matthew 24, verse 37. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as the days, for in as in those days, there were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving it to marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. The Son of Man is going to be like the flood of Noah. When the flood came and brought judgment, just like in Daniel, the flood was going to come against Israel. Just like in the book of Revelation, the, scorp the, the locust army, who was the army that came and destroyed the, sanct the sanctuary and the temple, uh, sorry, the temple and the city, that army was going to come out of the water, out of the bottomless pit, 
and bring a flood in for five months, 150 days, to bring judgment and destroy the wicked man. All of this is, is a play on what happened once again in Torah. That's all of Revelation is, restating Torah. So, this is about the Son of Moses being sung because they violated the covenant bringing forth a judgment. And in my last rebuttal round, I'm going to show how Christ prophesied an army was going to come and bring in a judgment, and he doesn't say anything about any demon army coming to do anything to anybody at any time. That was that's created by Americans. That's made it up, and nobody in the Bible believed that, and nobody said that. And uh, I, I think that's enough right there. Thank you, my brother. All right, good brother. All right, the brother Gardy concluded the rest of his time. He had a few seconds left, but he concluded the rest of the time. I do appreciate that, brother Guard, for the nice information, and I'm definitely enjoying this. I'm really multitasking for both of my iPhones, my tablet, and my laptop, so I can take notes and listen and monitor, make sure everybody gets the time that they deserve. So, with that being said, we're gonna roll over to the brother, your brother James. Brother James, whenever you're ready, whenever you start your ten minute. First rebuttal round will start whenever you start speaking, bro. All right, so you went you went to the Greek of Usos and went to the Septuagint and looked that up, and it mostly is referring to the to the deep as in the water. They use uh, the the word is used. The Greek word there, Abusos, is is actually a variation of another Greek word, uh, it's Buthos. And this is where uh, I think one one of the verses for Second Corinthians, Paul says, three times I was beaten with rods, I was stoned three times, should wreck a night and the day been in the deep. When you look up this word, when you look up this Greek word in Septuagint, all over the place, it's referring to the bottomless pit, it's referring to the deep. I'm not going to get into that right now because i got to finish. I'm learning how to manage my time, so I'm going to get into uh, where I left off. But anyways, and also just dealing real quick with the flood, uh, he's trying to tie in the, the 150 days to uh, – um, I even forgot what he was talking about. But it's, it's funny how the 150 days, uh, these demons are actually disembodied spirits of the giants, that they're allowed to torment people for the same amount of time that they were tormented through their death in the flood. But anyways, I'm going to pick it up at 9, verse, I'm sorry, Revelation 9 and verse 2. So let's get into the nitty gritty of this real quick. Hey, uh, Dre, can you post that picture that I, I sent you, that link to that picture of the locust? Is this brother's trying to do yeah, I got you. Want me to post it now? Yeah, go ahead and post it right okay. now. So uh, when you look at a picture of, of actual desert locusts that are prevalent in that area of West Africa and Palestine, you'll see, if y'all can just click on the link and take a picture, because take a great gander at this picture because it's worth a thousand words. And I'll just read real quick and explain what I mean. Revelation 9 and 2. Just post it at the top. All right, cool. And, uh, and he opened the bottomless pit and smoke arose out of the pit. And the smoke, like the smoke of a great furnace and, uh, you know, a place that, that's uh, full of uh, hot torment and heat. There's, it's obvious that smoke where there's smoke, there's fire. So, so the sun and the air were darkened by the smoke of the pit. Then out of verse three, then out of the smoke, locust. And this guy, I don't know what you were, I don't know what my opponent was trying to say about the smoke, but everybody's seen a football game where everybody comes out, they pop smoke and people emerge through the smoke. So I think that's all that's being described here. Then out of the smoke came locusts upon the earth, and uh, to them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. Scorpions have the power to torment when they bite you, the sting hurts. And one of the, uh, um, uh, one of the things that I looked up about a scorpion bite, it actually looks like a boil. It turns into something that looks like you've been burned. It gets that little uh, uh, pus underneath. And, uh, and what's interesting about these this uh, the torment of a scorpion when it uh, I'm sorry does the scorpions of the earth have power? Uh, you can look over in the Exodus. And remember, I referred earlier to uh, uh, Revelation is just simply a second Exodus, right? So one of the interesting, interesting things about Exodus chapter nine is this eighth plague. So let's read it real quick. I'm sorry, the sixth plague, it's chapter nine. But we read eight through twelve. So the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, "Take for yourselves handfuls of ashes from a furnace." And let Moses scatter it toward the heavens in the sight of Pharaoh, and it will become fine dust in all the land of Egypt, and it will cause boils that break out in sores, very reminiscent of scorpion bites, on man and beast throughout all the land. And they took ashes from the furnace and stood before Pharaoh, and Moses scattered them toward heaven. 
just like the smoke that came up out of the out of the bottomless pit and the locust emerged through the smoke. And they caused boils to break out in sores on man and beast, and magicians could not stand before Moses. One of the reasons they couldn't stand before him because they were in a lot of pain because of the boils. For the boils were on the magicians and on the were on the magicians and on the Egyptians, but the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh and he did not heed them. He did not repent. And you can read that also in Revelation um, 9, as well as them not repenting. Um, and just to, just to point out, let's go to Job real quick to point out these spiritual entities like demons and fallen angels can inflict uh, this type of damage. This happened to Job, uh, chapters 2, um, read verse 6 through 7. So this is a, a dialogue between uh, God and Satan. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, so Satan is just uh, uh, um, having this dialogue with God about how Job is simply uh, obeying God because he's blessed him with uh, material things. And, and, and God, earlier in this chapter, earlier, um, took away, allowed Satan to take away his, all his goods, his family. And now they've uh, come to an agreement that he's allowed to torment him, but not take his life. I'll read uh, chapter 2, verse 6 through 7. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand, the spirit his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And over in Job uh, chapter 3, verse 20 through 22, this is Job uh, uh, demonstrating the pain that he was in. This is, this, is, this, is what he, uh, this is what he said. Why is light given to him who is in misery and life to the bitter of soul? Who long for death, but it does not come and search for it more than hidden treasures who rejoice exceedingly and are glad when they can find the grave. Sounds like somebody looking for death, but can't find it. And so we have an evil spirit, Satan, allowed to torment this man in this way that is pain, right? Very reminiscent of uh, Revelation 9. So let's go over to, uh, just to tie in the locusts. The locusts said they had, uh, let me read the verse 5, verse 9, is, uh, Revelation 9 and 5, and they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them, for five months. The torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. So over in Luke, just to tie in the scorpion aspect, of course we know scorpions sting. Their venom is very painful. And uh, also in Luke uh, chapter 10, this is what Jesus says to the 70. 10, uh, Luke chapter 10, verse 17 through 19. Then the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall be nothing shall by any means hurt you. So right here we have a comparison. Jesus himself, our Lord and Savior, telling you that Satan, uh, that serpents and scorpions represent demons. Uh, let's see where I want to go now. So let's continue to read the revelation real quick. I'm going to try to break this down. Uh so Revelation 9 and 5, they were not given authority to kill them, Job, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. In those days, will seek death. men will seek death and not find it. They will desire to die, and death will flee from them. This is a supernatural thing that is occurring. These locusts represent the, the reason why locusts, again, another aspect of, of these demons is you can't stop them. Nothing physically can stop demons. You know what I'm saying? So verse 8, they had hair like women's hair and their teeth were like lion's teeth. You can look at the picture and you can see that they have these long antenna that, that is just like women's hair. And the lion's teeth is, a, is an actual quote from Joel. Joel 1 and uh, 6. For a nation has come up against my land strong and without number. His teeth are like the teeth of a lion and he has the fangs of a fierce lion. If you look at pictures of locusts, they actually look like they have lion's teeth. They have two big protruding fang-like looking uh, teeth that funnel everything into their mouth. And, and, and this on a, on a lion on a smaller scale is what the locust mouth looks like. I don't know if y'all can see that from the picture, but I'm sure you can see the crown of gold on their head and the, uh, the body armor. Uh, let's see if I can get to the armor real quick. Uh, they had breastplates. Hold on, let's see real quick. I'm going to go back to oh, the seven real quick. The shape of the locust was like horses prepared for battle. So he doesn't say the shapes of the locust or the appearance of the locust are like horses. He's saying like horses prepared for battle, horses wearing armor. If anybody is looking at the picture of locusts, they look like they have literal body armor on the back of their neck. 
right? So John is just simply seeing the locust that he would have seen in his day. The only addition is a scorpion's tail, and, and these represent demons. There's, this is not no amalgamation of soldiers or anything like that. You see an actual locust that represent demons. And verse, I'm going to verse 9, Revelation 9 and 9. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the sounds of chariots to run into battle. Again, this is just like in Joel. Joel describes them as having a, a sounding like. Uh, let's see. Joel 2 and 5. With a noise like chariots over mountaintops, they leap like the noise of a flaming fire that devours the stubble, like a strong people set in battle array. I don't have time to go into Joel uh, chapter 1 and 2, but all through Joel, he's talking about a, a swarm of locusts coming and, uh, and God using them to punish Israel. And he's talking about a literal locust. This is not an army. This is not demons in this context, but just to show you that John is actually seeing locusts in his vision and not horses and people riding on them. Let's see, what else can we deal with? The flood. He brought up the flood. You can read in, uh, I believe it's, where is it at? In Revelation, that the dragon spews water out of his mouth after the woman. The woman represents an army. I'm sorry, the flood that's coming out of the, the dragon's mouth represents an army. And, and, and the him trying to tie that in to the bottomless pit by going to the Septuagint and, and looking up the word abusos. I agree that the word abusos, when you look into the Septuagint, but they're used simultaneously alongside with the other Greek word that is synonymous. They're used side by side to refer uh, to the So, yep, that'll include the second rebuttal round of 10 minutes from each participant. Definitely, I appreciate both the brothers bringing forth that information. So we're about to tap into the cross examination. So what's going to happen is... Uh, we got one more rebuttal. A five-minute one. Uh, is that it? Uh, let me see. My, my bad, Brother Garden, because if that is it, you may be correct. I may have looked at that right. correctly. Yeah, you're correct, Brother Garden. I appreciate that. I'm, I'm looking at both of them. Appreciate that, Brother Garden. So Brother Garden is about to take off and get his five-minute rebuttal. And after that, the brother uh, James one is get his five minute rebuttal. So, whenever you're ready, brother Garden, let me know. We we'll start your time, good sir, and you'll be set up and good to go. All right, thank you, uh, and I thank you. I uh, appreciate the brother for taking the debate, and he agreed with me for a lot of things. Uh, just dealing with the theme is just what he don't agree with me. Uh, I don't believe, uh, you know, it's, it's astounding. He tried to make locusts look like lions and teeth and stuff. Uh, that was astounding to me. I don't. I mean, y'all just pick up a picture of a locust and y'all take it for yourselves. But and when you go to Matthew 24, let's go into Christ now to see what's supposed to happen at the end days. Matthew 24, 15. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whosoever reads it, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. So my brother said Revelation is about the second exodus. I definitely agree with that. Matthew 24, 16 is the second exodus. So I definitely agree that Revelation is about the second exodus. It is about Christ's prophecy. So when you go to verse number 29, it says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give off her lights, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. Once you go to Revelation 9 and verse number 2, and he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke arose out of the bottomless pit, and the smoke of a, as the smoke of a great furnace, so the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke, locusts came. So during the time when this tribulation happens, the, uh, immediately after the tribulation, that's when the sun is going to be darkened, and the Son of Man is going to appear in heaven. So, uh, Luke actually says it a little different way. So let's go to Luke. So this is Luke's account. Luke 20, 20, 21 and 20. And when you see Jerusalem come past with armies, then know the desolation thereof is nigh. Uh, Matthew called it the abomination of desolation. Verse 21. Then let those which in Judea flee to the mountains, that's the second exodus, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and let not them in the countries enter therein too. Why, Christ? For these be the days of vengeance, that all the things which are written may be fulfilled. That's a prophecy by Christ. Revelation 9 is dealing with woes. Woes are vengeance. These are the days of vengeance. These are the woes. They're the same thing. But now, 
So according to Christ, when Jerusalem is surrounded by armies, not demons, when Jerusalem is surrounded by armies, then the desolation is near and all things are going to be fulfilled. And then once you go to verse 23, but woe, you see the wall right there? Woe unto them that are with child. What's going on in Revelation 9? Woe. Woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. For uh, there should be great distress in the land and wrath upon these people. Is the locust wrath? Is the locust bringing wrath upon the people? Is the army bringing lo- uh, wrath upon the people? This is verse 24. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword. It should be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be tracked down of the Gentiles until the time when the Gentiles be fulfilled. If we go further on in the book of Revelation, chapter 9, you're going to see where people are going to start falling by the sword, by the, this army that's coming. So, according to Christ, the prophecy was all things will be fulfilled when the Roman army or the army surrounds Jerusalem. So, once you take Christ's prophecy, the testimony of Christ is the spirit of prophecy. If you take Christ's prophecy and put it in the book of Revelation chapter 9, you have locusts that's doing judgment upon a people via the song of Moses. So, that will be my closing and prayer. Let me just say it one more again. You cannot make locusts look like lions. You, you can't. You're not. You're not going to do that. Everybody Google a picture of a centaur and a manticore and look at it. That's what John used. He used the things from Greek mythology. He put them together and he said, this is what they look like. But that's why we have the Torahs and Christ is actually prophecy to explain what it actually is because the book of Revelation is symbolism that represents something else. So, that's what the locusts would represent, the Roman army. There's no prophecy that Christ ever gave about demons coming to do anything to anybody. And I'm going to ask my opponent to show me that when it's time for me to cross-examine him. Thank you. All right, all right. appreciate that, good brother Guard. appreciate that, good brother Guard. That was his five-minute as far as his second rebuttal round. Now we'll be going to Brother James. We'll have his second rebuttal round of five minutes. After this, we will be going into the Q&A. So, Brother James, you ready? Whenever you get started, you have a five-minute rebuttal round. Go ahead and state your position. Uh, so my opponent went to Matthew 24 to show that the uh, star, the sun and the moon will go dark. This this language is uh, apocalyptic language, or not a poetic language. It's used all throughout the Old Testament. Every time a nation is judged, Edom was judged. The sun, the moon, and the star went dark. Clothes with sackcloth, stars falling from heaven. This is a apocalyptic or poetic language, meaning time is up. Judgment is coming upon somebody. So to tie that in and just uh, uh, directly correlate that to uh, an age to come uh, is ridiculous. So um, Matthew 24 was fulfilled in 70 AD. And I'm, I'm telling you that, that there's ages to come. The, the, uh, the apostles in the New Testament talked about the end of their age. There were ages to come. First Corinthians, Paul said that the ages, the end of the ages came upon uh, the people in the wilderness. And so there's 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 several ages. And when just because the, you know, the apostles didn't, you know, dealing with the end of an age, they didn't understand how the time was going to fly. They, they thought the Romans would probably come in and destroy the temple and Jesus would return and that'd be the resurrection. That wasn't the case. We're still in this intermediate stage. But anyways, uh, I just want to throw in there real quick, uh, dealing with Revelation 9. It says they, they were commanded, these locusts, right? that our demons were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing. Why would you say that if, if they weren't locusts? John was seeing locusts, so the angel, whoever was explaining this to him, had to tell him that, look, these locusts aren't going to do what locusts, locusts usually do. They're not eating any grass or green thing or any tree, but only the men that do not have the seal of God on their forehead. And this cannot be the Roman army, because the Roman army in, in Josephus actually destroyed all the trees in Jerusalem. I'll read it real quick. This is uh, Josephus or the Jews, chapter three. Um, sorry, chapter. This is uh, chapter three, section two. But Titus intending to pitch his camp near to the city, 
and Scopus placed as many of his choice horsemen and footmen as they thought sufficient opposite to the Jews to prevent their sallying out upon them, while he gave orders for the whole army to level the distance as far as the wall of the city. This is this is around the siege. So they threw down all the hedges and all the walls the inhabitants had made about the gardens and the groves of trees and cut down all the fruit trees that lay between them and the wall of the city and filled up the hollow places and the chasms and demolished the rocky precipices of iron instruments. And again, let's, let's get another um, chapter six of Josephus' War of the Jews. This is chapter six. I don't have anything on that. But anyways, okay. And he's, he's talking about, I think he made a comment on I'm saying the, the locusts uh, look like lions. It doesn't say that they look like lions. It says they have teeth like lions. And this, this lines up with Joel. Joel is not describing, you read the context of Joel, it's describing actual locusts. Two minutes. If you, anybody can pick up a spider and hold it in their hand and not be able to see the intricate details, but we don't know what this vision looked like to John, him seeing an HD close-up or whatever, and all he did was compare their teeth on a miniature scale to what he sees in lions, and Joel is the same thing. They have these two large teeth in the front, are mandible-like looking things. I'm not saying they look exactly like lion's teeth. They, they, that's not what he's describing. He's describing locusts, and the only difference between natural locust and these vision is the scorpion tail, which leads you to demons. Because we read again that uh, Jesus said, I give you the power to trample on scorpions and serpents. And he compared that to demons. So that's all I got. And uh, peace. Appreciate everybody coming out. How are you? All right. Appreciate that. Appreciate that. Both the brothers have concluded in their second rebuttal in that sense. So now we're about to go into the Q and as far as the cross examination, what I like to call the Q and A, where I'm going to get to question each other. So the brother uh, Garden does get the chance to go first because he did take uh, he, he went first in the sense of bringing ice open in the room. So he gets the question, brother James first in regards to asking his questions. So brother Garden will have ten minutes to pose his questions. Brother James, you have two minutes to answer the questions that are posed to you. You cannot ask Brother Garden a question. You can only answer questions. And if it is a yes or no question, you do have to answer first with a yes or no. And then you can expound and take your two-minute time. So whenever the Brother Garden start, whenever you start Brother Garden, your time will start. This is your 10-minute round of pose your questions. Just, just one second, Drake. Uh, yes, sir. During, during the answering, and, and uh, Brother James answers uh, for two minutes, do I pause uh, Garden's time, or that's a part of uh, Garden's time? As far as his two minutes to respond, as far as when he's answering? Yeah. Pause his time while he does his two minutes. Okay, all right. And, and the same thing will go, you know, vice versa. When Brother James asks his question, we're going to pause the time. And time will only start when he's posing his question, when he's saying whatever he said. That way, a brother get a full two minutes, and neither one of them really chew, it, chew away at each other's time. So, whenever you start your brother garden, it's on you. Okay, thank you. Um, so, Revelation 9, verse 2. Um, is that what Revelation 6, verse 12 is talking about? Revelation is Revelation nine and two. You said talking. You said talking about Revelation six and twelve. Hold on. Hey, can I can I answer that? Because I know y'all said he's not supposed to answer the Yes. Yeah. yeah, and if he's just trying to get it clarified, which which is what it sound like, and your time got stopped, all right? So you good? So your time ain't continuing. Yeah, I, I have to look at the concept. I got to. So are you? So are you? And you can ask a question, James. What was your quirk, your clarifying question, so you can understand? His question? Just what you said. You said is Revelation nine two the same as Revelation six twelve? Yes, sir. Right. Um, let me just jump in for a minute. Um, for clarity and for everybody who's listening, Gordon, if you want to ask him a question about a scripture. Because you can't assume that he just knows off the top of his head. Because I don't even know what Revelation 6 and 12 says. should probably turn there first, read it, and then ask him, is it talking about the other verse? And then read that too. And then his time will start with the question. 
That sounds fair to you? Oh, uh, yes, sir. I, my bad. I thought Brother James would have his Bible open. You know. uh, I got you, though. I got you. Right, right, right. Okay. right. Mm-hmm. All right, so this is Revelation 9 and 2, and then I'm going to read uh, Revelation 6 and, and uh, 12. This is Revelation 9 and 2. It says, And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. Is that this in Revelation six twelve? And I beheld, and he opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. Is those speaking on the same thing? They're speaking about the same time period. Not, I mean, this, you're dealing with poetic language. Uh, yes. Well, no. I don't even know how to I don't know how to answer that. You have to say you have to say yes or no first. And if you don't know, just say you don't know. But before you elaborate, you have to say yes or no. Yes. Go ahead, James. And the reason why I say yes is because in Revelation nine two is a part of the the trumpets, and this this opening of the seal is a signification of judgment. And the trumpet, the fifth, first, fourth. First, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh trumpets are all judgments. So this is the first woe in Revelation 9, 2 that we're reading. And so this would correlate to what's going on. But this is a bigger picture. Uh, Revelation 6 covers all the trumpets. So you're, we're going within. When we go to chapter 9, we're going within this, this what's taking place, what's causing this sun and moon to darken. I, I stated earlier that this is poetic language about judgment coming upon uh, either a nation or the whole world. In this case, the whole world. That's it. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, my next question will be: You told, you said earlier that poetic language that occurs every time a nation was judged. Um, what so? What nation is being judged in Revelation six twelve? The whole world. Okay, okay, bad, 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 bad. okay, so now, once I go to Revelation 6 and 8, let me read it. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that set upon him was death, and hell followed him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beast of the earth. Is Revelation 6 8, is that the same thing in Revelation 9? Verse number uh, three and four, when the locust came up and the locust had the, the teeth of lions and etc. Is that talking about the same event? No. Okay. And the, so, and the, reason, okay. the, reason why, the reason why I say that is so I looked there for an uphill horse, his rider was named Death, and Hades followed him. They were given power on the fourth year. Yeah, I'm just going to say no, I'm not going to elaborate. Oh, okay, um, all right. So, when I go to Revelation um, 6, 6, 4, and he said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from from him that sitteth on the throne and for the wrath of the Lamb. Is that the same thing found in Revelation nine when it said that they would seek death but not find it? Uh, no. Revelation six sixteen is talking about the second coming of Jesus. This is after the seven seal is opened and Arm. Uh, this is around Armageddon. So yeah, this is not. This is not talking about uh, Revelation 9. Okay, if a person says to a mountain, fall on us, is that person trying to commit suicide? Uh, no, that's poetic language that is used all, all throughout the Old Testament when uh, God is judging a people or peoples. Uh, it's used, I don't know if I have time to pull it up, but yeah, it's used all over the Old Testament that the they will call to the mountains and rocks. This is a poetic way of saying, you know, hide us from, from judgment. Was Revelation 9 a judgment from God? Yes. 
Is Revelation 6 a judgment from God? All of Revelation, yes, all of Revelation is a judgment from God. Are they all within the same time period? Yes. Debate over. Uh, Revelation 9, and let's go to verse number... Um, this, you did it right there. Uh, Revelation 9 and 2. Um, would you, are you saying the locust came out of the smoke or the bottomless pit according to the scripture? Let me read it. And he opened the bottomless pit and there rose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace and the sun and the air was darkened. Sorry. Uh, and of the smoke of the pit, verse three, my bad. And there came out the smoke locust upon the earth. So what are you what are you asking me? Um, Did the locusts come from the smoke or the bottomless pit? The lo- the locusts came from the bottomless pit. John is seeing a vision. So this is a this is like he's watching a movie. Um, I don't know if you're you're trying to insinuate that the the locusts, I mean the smoke, materialized into locusts. I don't know what he exactly saw, but he's describing the pit opening, smoke coming out, and then locusts coming upon the earth so both the smoke and the locusts come out of the pit okay this is the uh the curses deuteronomy 28 and 22 because you said that uh you studied uh the symptoms of a scorpion sting so this is deuteronomy 28 22 the lord shall smite thee with a consumption and with a fever and with an inflammation and with a string burning are those symptoms of a scorpion sting? Uh, could you state those again, please? Okay, I got you. Deuteronomy 28 and 22. The Lord shall smite thee with a consumption and with a fever and with inflammation and with a string burning. Is, those, is that symptoms of a scorpion sting? Uh, uh, I don't know what to know. I don't know what consumption is. Okay, leave out. Let me leave out consumption there. Okay, I, I got you. The Lord shall smite thee with a fever, with inflammation, and with a string burning. Are those symptoms of a scorpion sting? Yes, they they can be symptoms of a scorpion sting. They can be symptoms of multiple illnesses and 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 uh, plagues and sicknesses that God can put upon people. It's also okay. happened this happened in the Exodus as well and happened other times as well in, in, in the wilderness with Deuteronomy and the serpents and the scorpions and all that. Okay. Are the plagues of Exodus found within the curses of Deuteronomy 28? Uh, are the plagues... I would say yes. So, are the plagues of Exodus found in the book of Revelation? Yes. Are the plagues in Revelation found in the curses of Deuteronomy? There, there are, yes, there are some similar plagues all throughout the Bible, but they're, they're, not, they're not super consistent on a perfect, you know, uh, basis. There are some that God uses, does things in similar ways throughout. He doesn't really change. He kind of does the same thing throughout throughout the evolution of the historical history of the Bible. Okay, okay, thank you. And so now, are there any demons in the curses? Uh, metaphorically, yes, they are. He says he will send serpents and scorpions among them. And those throughout the Bible represent demons as well as angels. Um, so you are, okay. So it says, uh, where is it in? I'm just going to read Psalms real quick, talking about how the curses, what the curses were. And when you go over to Revelation 9, you know, not dealing with the locusts, but further down, these four angels that are bound at the great river Euphrates. You also read, um, sh- 
Forgive me, I ain't gonna take up too much of your time. If I can't find it, I'll just stop. He said in, in, in Psalms, it says, David says that he sent his evil angels among them. So that's what who was performing the, uh, the plagues was the angels. And dealing with those uh, four bound at the Great River Euphrates, uh, we didn't get into that. But all that imagery is describing a seraphim angel. When you go look up a seraphim, they're always described as fiery serpents. And the, the name is, is translated or the word in Hebrew is translated fiery serpent is also correspond to the seraphim angels. So are uh, the seraphim angels, I'm sorry. No, I'm done. Go ahead. Are the seraphim angels demons? They're spirits. Okay, we're talking no, about not. demons. Okay, okay then. Yes okay, no, say it again, James. Need a yes or no before every. No, uh, no, they, no, they're not demons. They are spirits. Specifically, not demons. So, so if if Psalm is speaking on evil angels, which are seraphim, and that's talking about the curses, are the curses talking about demons? Yes, metaphorically they are. I do believe some of the curses are talking about demons. Uh, okay. Um. Um. Uh, how much time I got left? We can't say that part, uh, Zara. We can't. We can't say what time you you got. Oh, two oh, okay. Yeah, you get a two minute warning. I'm following with your brothers too to make sure. So you okay, get a two okay. minute warning, and then you know it'll be on the front. Okay, then I got you. I got you. Um, all the teeth. Of lions in Revelation nine, the teeth of beast in the Song of Moses. No. Okay, is a lion a beast? A beast. Yes. Okay. Um. So. Where do you stop the Song of Moses in the book of Revelation? I don't tie in the book of, of the Song of Moses to the interpretation of Re Re Revelation. The Song of Moses is just simply referring to the redeemed singing the Song of Moses, which is the 144,000 and the multitude behind them in Revelation. Those that are redeemed from among men who make it out of the tribulation. So those who come out. Okay. So, thank you. Uh, where did Christ or anybody in the New Testament testify of demon armies coming to destroy the world? Uh, Revelation 9, verse 1 through 6. Okay, everything is, is, is based off of two or three witnesses. Are there any more witnesses in the New Testament that shows Christ or the apostles prophesying or the whole Bible? Anyone prophesying outside of the book of Revelation, demon armies coming to destroy the world? Uh, yes, well, uh, Elijah in the Old Testament would call down fire from heaven. And I think if you look into that, that was angels performing those miracles for Elijah and you read of the same thing happening in Revelation. So I don't know if that answers your question. Now, I'm going re to restate it. Throughout Genesis through um, uh, before we get to Revelation, which will be what, James or Peter or something, before the, anything outside of the book of Revelation, did anyone prophesy about a demon horde or a demon army coming to destroy anybody throughout the Bible? Uh, no, no, I can't think of anything offhand. No. I stopped my time. All right. How much, how much time did he have? He, 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 had ten, long. Yeah, he had 10 minutes. He had 10 minutes to ask the question. Okay. We, yeah, we, the same time you're going to have, uh, when you were responding, his time was stop. So you had two minutes, up to two minutes to respond to his questions. And he and he did yield it honestly with a little bit over two to almost three minutes. Okay, I thought it was I thought it was five minutes for some reason. That's cool. Yeah, it was ten. He had ten minutes to pose all his questions. You any question he posed to you, you had up to two minutes to respond. And as you were responding, his time did get stopped. 
So, you know, you could respond. He did, um, he did stop with me on the road for almost probably three minutes. Even his timekeepers probably keep track also, but it's maybe earlier. Really. So, that is included as far as, you know, the brother Gardner's cross examination. Uh, we're going to move into the brother James cross examination. So, he's going to get to ask with the Gardner. Same thing. So, he's going to get 10 minutes to pose his questions. As Brother Gard is answering, and I'm going to stop his. T- I'm going to stop James' time, and if someone can hold the two minutes that Gard gets to answer each question that he attempts to answer, in most cases, usually pretty quick. Most brothers usually don't use their whole two minutes anyway. So I'm going to hold the time for the good brother James as far as his ten minute question. So I'm going to you know time the good brother Garden in regards to his two minute response. Yeah, I got you. So sure. the- all right, thank you, brother. So, if, uh, as soon as you start, brother James, you, you, your time will start. All right, um, brother Garden. The Revelation twenty and seven reads: Now, when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison. Is this prison the bottomless pit? I would say yes, because uh, all the judgment came out of the bottomless pit. So I would say yes, his imprisonment would be within the bottomless pit. Okay, so it says uh, verse eight, and will go out to deceive the nascent nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. Did this happen in the first century? Um, I would say yes, it did happen in the first century. And the reason, because uh, the Targums that I read earlier, it agrees with it. This is Deuteronomy 32, 39, which was supposed to happen in the last days. It says, out of the Targums, when the word of the Lord, who is the Messiah, shall reveal himself to redeem his people, that will be the second coming, he will say to all the nations, behold, now that I am he who am, who was, and will be, and there is no God beside me, I and my word kill and make alive. I smite the people of Beth Israel. So this is the destruction of Israel. And I will heal them at the end of the days. And there will be none that can deliver them from my hand. God and his armies, whom I have permitted to make war against them. So I would say that's the Roman army that the Lord permitted to make war against Israel in the first century. All right, um, so let's deal with, I'm going to ask you a question about Revelation 20. I'm going to go to Revelation 20 and 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads, on their head, or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Did this happen in the first century? Uh, yes. Uh, once I look at Revelation 20 and 4, it says, I saw the thrones and them that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. So these people are receiving thrones, which is said in Matthew 19 and 28. And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in his throne of glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So I will put that within that. And since these individuals have been beheaded, these individuals are going through what Christ prophesied as the tribulation period. During the tribulation period, it was going to be a time like has never been, nor whatever shall be. I would say that that is the time that the saints were being killed for the testimony of the Messiah, which happened in first century. So, um, the, so what do you do with the thousand years? What do you do with the thousand years that they reigned with Christ? Is that literal? Is that a literal thousand years? Well, I would take that this has, or sorry, no. And I would say the reason because uh, this is based off of the Song of Moses and etc., the Song of the Lamb, and there's no two or three witnesses that ever stated the Messiah would only reign one thousand years with his saints. That's not found in the in the law. 
of the prophets. So I would say it's symbolism for something else outside of a literal thousand. And that's why you don't see anyone talking about it in the Old or New Testament. Outside of the book of Revelation, sorry. All right, this goes to, it is your understanding that the the locusts in Revelation 9 are the Roman army. So, um, let me see here. So how do you explain if the, if the locusts, um, if the locusts in Revelation 9 are the Roman army? How do you explain in Josephus that they're destroying plant life? How do you explain that? Because it's, it's just using imagery. That's, that's all it is. It says, and they were commanded not that they should that they should not hurt the grass or the earth, neither green thing, but only men who have not the seal of God in their foreheads. That's not what locusts do. So he goes on to explain that those same locusts have to torment man by the torment of a scorpion. And that is found inside of the curses of Deuteronomy 28, which we, we agreed to earlier. And this will be my last statement. I hope my two minutes ain't up. And I read in Deuteronomy 32, 24, from the Jerusalem, no, sorry, the Aramaic Targums, that in the last days, the Japanese Greeks will be sent and they will come and bite like wild animals. And he was going to send them against Israel in the last days. That same imagery is in Revelation 9. They had the teeth of beasts. So the Targums explains what that meant, which was the Greeks, the Romans. All right, Revelation 9, uh, it states about the locusts, that the uh, locusts are commanded not to, just to torture for five months. They're not uh, given permission to kill anybody for five months. Uh, did the Roman army kill Jews in those five months in the first century? No, no. As you read on through Revelation, the death comes later. In Revelation 9, beginning... That's the torment of a scorpion, which is the plagues coming upon Israel. And it stated that these plagues will pursue them until death. So they have to be pursued first, which means they're not dead if they're being pursued. So first the curses has to come upon them before the death overtakes them. So in Revelation 9, as we continue to read, the death comes afterwards so the pursuing comes first then the death the five months represents the flood that's coming and then the death follows in revelation 9 so is the five months a literal five months no no sir the five months represented the time period of the flood which was 150 days and christ prophesied in the end the end will be like Noah days until the flood overtakes them, which was a 150 days, five months thing. Daniel 9 says the same thing. When the sanctuary and the city were to be taken, they were going to be taken by a flood. And we read the flood was only five months. So it's just alluding back to that. It's not saying exact. So the, the 150 days in the flood, were those a literal 150 days in the actual flood? No, 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 no. All of these things are, are symbolic. Jews love uh, numbers. They love numbers 10. They love numbers 5. They, this is just how they operate it. So, no, I don't even, personally, I don't even take the, the story of, of the art, Noah's art, to be as literal as people say anyway, but... That's just my my stance, but so I would say no. Alrighty. Um, so Joel chapter one. I'm gonna read a couple verses and ask you a question. Joel one, uh, one and four. What the chewing locust left, the swarming locust is eaten. What the swarming locust left, the crawling locust is eaten. What the crawling locust left, the consuming locust has eaten. 
Awake you drunkards and weep, verse 5, and wail, all you drunkards of wine, drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it has been cut off from your mouth. And Joel chapters 1, verse 4 and 5, which I just read, are these literal locusts? Hold on, give me, let, me, let me get there real fast. I was trying to get there while you were saying. So give me one second. Joel 1, you said uh, 4. What, what did you read? Uh, four, four, verse, you read verse 4. The question is, uh, I'll read it for you again. Joel 1 and 4. What the chewing locust left, the swarming locust is eaten. What the swarming locust left, the crawling locust is eaten. And what the crawling locust left, the consuming locust is eaten. Are those literal locusts? Uh, uh, no, uh, I would say no, and these are actually the prophecy or the uh, curses of Deuteronomy 28. Once again, it was a locust curse that came in Deuteronomy 28, but as we continue to read Deuteronomy 28, we find out that it is a nation. In fact, I want to read verse number 5 and 6 to go with your verse 4. It's It says, Awake ye drunkards and weep. This is verse 5. You read verse 4. Awake ye drunkards and weep and howl, all drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth, for a nation is come upon my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of lions, and have the cheek teeth of a great lion. It's the same imagery in the book of Revelation. This is talking about an army, not the locust. The locust is used symbolic to represent the army. Symbolic, okay. Um, so down, uh, Joel chapter 1, verse 20, it says, The beast of the field also cry out to you, for the water brooks are dried up, and fire has devoured the open pastures. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going to back up. Verse 19, O Lord, to you I cry out, for fire has devoured the open pastures, and a flame has burned all the trees of the field. It's not even the one I wanted, I'm sorry. <laughs> um... I don't know where I want to go to next. All right. Um, hey, I'm just gonna go ahead and yield my time, so I don't have I don't have anything prepared. That's all I got. All right, gentlemen. All right, gentlemen. Appreciate that. Both the brothers brought the information and brought the information. The brother has yielded the remainder of his time. So we're gonna get into the item. We just want to make sure. I believe it's the conclusion where both brothers want to demonstrate as far as go into what it is that they believe they tore. And as far as their understanding, both brothers, I believe, will get five minutes. I know that last, last time I was wrong, the good brother part let me know, and I appreciate that. So if I was wrong again, I'd certainly do the same. But I'm looking at it now. But so the good brother Garden, you have five minutes, good brother, to conclude as far as what you believe your position was what you taught your representative, or as far as any, you know, any, any part of the information you'd like to bring out tonight for your position. All right. I would like to say uh, thank you, Brother Josh, for allowing me to be on your platform and do this debate. Thank you, Brother Dre, for uh, moderating. And thank you, uh, my side, for coming and helping uh, represent with me. It's not just kind of out the line. Unless I'm looking at this wrong, it says Q&A, then conclude. Oh, let me stop there. The security yeah. include your on yours? It says yes. It says right here, I'm looking at it right now. It says closing statement, um, five minutes, right? Yeah, ten minutes, then it says, hold on, am I looking at this one? Yo. Then it, when you say conclude, it says closing statements. It got concluded in here too. Right. I think this what's throwing me off. Okay. Are, are, are the five minute closing statements what they're doing right now? Yeah, that was what they was gonna do right now, and they was gonna get their other yeah. questions from the audience. Yeah. Okay, what confused me? I'm sorry, y'all. What confused me in the notes? It says closing statements five minutes, and then it says listening audience, and then it says conclude at the end. Yeah, gotcha. so I thought that's what y'all was dealing with. That's what confused me, y'all. So closing statements is the same thing as concluding statements. I'm with you now. Sorry yes, about sir. that. Part. Yes, sir. I'm back, uh, Garden. So we'll start the time over. You start off first, you know, the brand new five minutes. And you take off. I, I want to say uh, thank you, Brother Josh, for allowing me to be on your platform and to do the debate. Thank you, Brother Dre, for uh, moderating. I definitely appreciate it. Thank you, everyone that's on Brother James' side. 
and thank you everyone that was on my side for uh, doing such a wonderful job. Uh, the point that I came in to show was that the Revelation, the book of Revelation itself, to understand Revelation, you have to understand that it's about Christ, Christ's prophecy, and the Song of Moses, which concluded the Old Covenant. And that's why I kept going back from the Song of Moses and the curses of Deuteronomy to show the application of it inside of the book of Revelation. And I also use uh, the ancient works are found in the Targums to explain what some of these this imagery represented. So I was able to show that the locusts who had the teeth of, of lions is found in the Song of Moses when he said I'm going to send against you the teeth of beasts. The, a lion is a beast. I'm going to send it against you. And then we have the Targums explaining that that actually is the Greeks. The Romans are the Greeks, the, the children of the Greeks. They're, what they're, about. they're the Greeks that was supposed to come against Israel in the last day. And that's not my words. That's found in the Targums, the Palestinian Targums, the Aramaic Targums. That's not garden. That's their works. So they said the Greeks represents those uh beasts with those lion teeth that was going to come against them and that same imagery is given over to the locusts uh, so I was just trying to show that we have to be uh, uh, familiar with Christ's prophecy about Rome coming against Jerusalem to destroy it with a flood we got to look at the imagery of the five months in the bottomless pit, which is an abyss cistern, which contains water. And as you go through Revelation 13, where is that beast of many features coming out of? The water, out the sea, out the bottomless pit. That's why it's using that, that imagery, that analogy of the locust coming out of the water. The locusts would represent that that uh, Roman army or that beast of Revelation 13 that was supposed to come out of the sea or that beast and that fourth beast in, in Daniel 7 that was going to come out of the sea as a judgment used as a judgment against the wicked Israel. And I do agree with a lot of things that my brother said. I agree that the that second exodus is found in the book of Revelation. But the second exodus is also found in Christ's prophecies. So, I, I mean, I, it's a lot that we could have brought up, but I thank you guys for listening in, and hopefully uh, we took notes on both sides and just wrestled with the information. But, you know, I, I'm pleased uh, that we had such a delightful debate, and thank everyone for listening on, and hopefully uh, more is, uh, you know information comes out in the future. Uh, thank you all. Once again, thank you, Drake. All right. Thank you, good sir. Thank you, good sir. Appreciate you, brother Garth. Thank you for taking the debate. Thank you for coming up and you know being a stand up. All right, and brother James, you have your five minutes now to bring forth what you believe, you try your position, and what you demonstrated in your assessment in the debate tonight. Yeah, Pete. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for showing up as well. Uh, yeah, I think it's pretty straightforward. Uh, when you look at Revelation nine and you look at Revelation twenty. Uh, you see things coming out of this bottomless pit, uh, which is a spiritual prison. Uh, in Revelation 20, we established that Satan is thrown there. It's called the prison. Satan is a spiritual being, an angel, fallen angel. Um, so this, this, this bottomless pit in the context of Revelation 9 and Revelation 20 is referring to a spiritual prison uh, which holds spiritual entities. And this is spoken of as well in uh, Jude 1 and 6, verse 1 and 6. I'm sorry, chapter 1, verse 6. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain but left their own abode, he has reserved an everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. That everlasting chains of darkness, chains being a prison, confined, darkness, the bottomless pit. And again, in uh, 2 Peter um, chapter 2, verse 4, for if God did not spare the angels who sinned but cast them down to hell, uh, that is Tartarus, and that's the only time this word is actually used in the Greek. Can't find it in Septuagint as well. So let's go ahead and look this word up real quick. Uh, I don't think I'll look this word up. Uh, cast them down to hell. The word hell here is Tartaru. And the 
Greek lexicon says, name of a subterranean region, literal subterranean region, doleful and dark, regarded by the ancient Greeks as the abode of the wicked dead, where they suffer punishment for their evil deeds. It answers to the Gehenna of the Jews. So again, I think it's, it's very straightforward. Uh, when you look at Revelation 9, it's just a, a, a reverse somebody letting somebody out of a prison. Revelation 20, somebody's locking somebody up in a spiritual prison. And uh, I think when you when you tie in uh, the word abyss in the Greek, abusos, to these demons uh, crying or pleading with Jesus not to be cast there and to not be tormented, uh, you can tie the two in together that there's a, this is a place and I, that, that, that where spiritual entities are confined and tormented until they're unleashed on mankind as a judgment. And um, one thing you see that's different, I know he's going to Matthew 24 a lot to try to say that was fulfilled, uh, that this is referring to Revelation. I believe Matthew 24 was completely fulfilled in 70 AD, and that is what it's referring to. But to tie it into Revelation is, is more than a stretch, because all the if, if Revelation is an exodus, and both of them, Matthew 24 and Revelation, are both judgments, but in the difference, Matthew 24 was not an exodus. Matthew 24 was just a judgment. Now, Revelation is a judgment with an exodus. And when you see the plagues and all the things happening in the language, you see this similar thing in the book of uh, in the Exodus with the hail. And all these things are performed by angels. I went to the scripture, you know, showing that God sent evil angels among them. That evil angels doesn't necessarily represent uh, represent bad angels or fallen angels, but calamity, angels bringing calamity, which they brought upon the Egyptians. I went and showed that the sixth plague in the Exodus mirrors what is happening in Revelation 9, where Moses and Aaron tossed up the ashes into the air uh, and boils came upon the people and they couldn't, couldn't stand before Moses, which I inferred was because of the pain. Um, yeah, so uh, like I said, I think it's pretty straightforward. Um, again, John, I believe if you look in the context of it, if you look at a picture of a swarming locust, specifically a desert locust uh, that is found in that region, they do resemble horses wearing armor. They do have crowns of gold on their head. It looks like a crown of gold. If, it, if they would have been actual crowns of gold, I don't know, maybe John would have used a little bit different language. He actually calls them locusts. Um, and again, uh, uh, locusts are a, a form of God's judgment. They are innumerable. The Roman army could be numbered. Uh, the Roman army in, in the first century killed a lot of people. You can read this in Josephus, Titus himself, the general or Caesar actually killed tons of people in the in the siege during the siege um you can read about the roman army destroying plant life when there come these locusts whoever these locusts are commanded not to harm every any green thing and i believe that's literal we can't spiritualize the entire bible then we're dealing with confusion we have nothing to stand on i can make it whatever i want to make it so i feel that i, I i've proven my point um hopefully uh, i brought forth a little bit of information so y'all can tie my logic together and, and see what these see mm -hmm. what revelation 9 is actually talking about but that's all i got i yield my time okay. yeah all right well i appreciate that i appreciate both participants i think both brothers brought out great information did a good job at presenting their argument so we don't so i don't belabor the point lastly uh, we have up to five questions for both participants from the audience. So if anyone wants to pose up to five questions for both sides, we're going to keep it balanced. Uh, we're going to try and keep it fair. That way, you know, both sides are able to address a similar amount of questions. If so, we just want to ask you firstly, if you have a question that you want to pose to the brother James, you can raise your hand now. I want to bring up up to and limited to five questions for the brother James, as it'll be the same thing when I pose questions, we'll bring up the questions for Brother Garden. So if you have questions for Brother Garden, and if we don't have up to five, it's fine. Whatever we have for the brother James, we'll do the same thing for the brother Garden to make it fair. So if you have a, a question that you'd like to pose to brother James, we got two right now. I want to bring both the brothers up. I want to bring them both up. That's two. And the uh, chat room is on now. Just letting everybody know the chat room is on. Yes, sir. Chat is on. I did uh, bring up both the brothers, at least I uh, accepted both the brothers. 
who wanted to pose the question of Brother James. It was only two. It was only two. So, and I'm going to leave it open, y'all. We're going to take a few more seconds. If you got a question, to pose it as Brother James and his idea and his take. You can raise your hand up. We'll get you up there. You can pose a question. No one else is raising their hand, and we only have two right now. So to be fair to Brother Garden, we want to do the same thing. Uh, two, if you have any questions you'd like to pose to the Brother Garden, I'm going to bring up the first two. We got a question for Brother Garden, and you can pose your question to him. And I don't, after that, that'll pretty much conclude, you know, the debate and everything. We have one. We have one more question. Anybody else? Okay, there we go. So we got two questions for Brother James and two questions for Brother Garden. Uh, the first brother that was brought up, it looked like it was Brother Sharp. Well, I'm going to go back and forth. I'm going to bring one for Brother James, one for Brother Garden, and one for Brother James. We'll go back and forth. We'll get both the brothers, you know, and James and Connie, you know, got their thoughts. So, Brother Sharp, you can pose your question, good sir. Oh, I appreciate it. Thank uh, both of the debaters for the for the uh, for the conversation. My question is, uh, Brother James said that Revelation was talking about an exodus. Can you identify when that exodus started? Does any other New Testament book collaborate an exodus? And is the exodus forty years like the exodus in with Moses? And when did that exit? Whoa, 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 whoa. You guys have like four questions. Okay, my bad. You can only ask one question. One question per person. You know, and those those were some essay questions. That took me back to my college days. You know how one long question had like four parts to it? So, uh, sharp. You seem like you were a sharp brother. So, just ask the main question you would like for um, James to answer. Thank you. When did the exodus start that you said uh, is in the book of Revelation? Uh, that exodus has not started yet. That exodus will coincide with the second coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All right. That was the answer. That, was you done, James? I didn't want to. That was yeah, that's it. That's okay. It. Put a brother down. We're gonna bring brother Kev next to ask a question. I believe he's asking. Is your question for brother Garden Kev? Yes, sir. All right, take off. Then we're gonna get back to the question for brother James. Okay, really quick. Uh, it, it'll be really fast. Uh, in terms of the Roman army, uh, if you go back to Revelation nine, I'll read it really quickly. I'll ask my question. Uh, it says here, Romans nine and four. It says, and it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither anything, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their hand, on their foreheads. Now, I do know that you guys are pretty rich, and you do believe it's already happened. So my question is, who is the actual men that had the seal on their foreheads? Can you, can you tell me who that is? Because I can't tell, at least, from the, at least based on Josephus, and the kills that went on there, and what I'm reading, I can't tell that it's already happened. So who would you who would you say are the men with the uh, with the seal on their foreheads? Brother Gar, you have the floor. Brother Gar, are you there? You might uh, be on mute. Yeah, there you go. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Give me one second. One second. One second. All right, so let's see here. If I go to Ephesians 1, I'm going to read chap, uh, verses um, 10 through 13, if you've if got some time. It says that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to so that we should be to pray, to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard in the word of truth the gospel of salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So I would say the individuals that had the seal 
was the people that were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise after receiving the gospel and some of the baptism. So I believe that sealing right there is of the Holy Spirit. All right. All right. Appreciate that. Good, sir. Appreciate that. Good, sir. Next question, like his brother is, uh, I believe I brought him up his question for Jane. Uh, you can bring out your question is, and you got the plug. Oh, and just so everybody know, just a reminder, the questions have to be related to the debate. I think I need to point that out because people will just throw out rando questions. And that's cool because, you know, people like to ask about different things, but it has to pertain to the debate. Go ahead. If you're talking ears, we can't hear you. You might still be on mute. Oh, yeah, I didn't hear yeah, you. I didn't know what I talking to. Hey, in uh, uh, Revelation... I heard the brother say that these were supposed to be some type of demon locusts. We know things in the parallel, but they parallel in the natural and the spiritual. So when you read Revelation 9 and 11, they say they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottom of the pit, whose name in the Hebrew is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue, his name is Apollyon. Now, he said these were locusts. But when you read Proverbs 30 and 27, they say the locusts have no king, yet they go forth all of them by bands. If these is real locusts, why do they have a king go with them instead of like Proverbs say? Well, visions are metaphors. I'm saying that John is seeing a locust that represents something else. You can also read a couple chapters later where a woman is clothed with the sun and the moon and 12 stars above her head. So it's a literal, I think he's seeing a literal woman with, you know, sun and moon above their head, what a woman looks like, but this represents the nation of Israel. So just like, you know, the, the woman represents Israel. These locusts represent demons. That's what I'm saying. And uh, these demons do have a king over them, a ruler over them. And uh, one of the things uh, the angel was called uh, in, in, in the Exodus was called the destroying angel. That's it. All right. Appreciate that. Uh, let's look at Brother Gregory is up there first. So I think he was up here first, Josh. So I know Brother uh, Mekara. He got brought up last. That, that'll kind of make it unbalanced in the question. So I figure Brother Gregory to be just fair that he, that he gets the last question, Brother Gardner, that way he ends off at 2 2. Unless we can get one more person that want to ask Brother James a question, that way it'll be. I don't three, mind, three. brother. You don't mind? Okay, 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 cool. All right, we got one more anyway. So it'll be 3 3. And uh, we'll balance it out like that. And that'll be, uh, th that'll be it. All right, Brother Gregory, you got the flow. Hey, Brother Dre, I was actually going to see, I didn't know if you uh, announced it, but uh, I was going to see if, if I could ask a question to get each one of them to reply to it. Do it have to be the one person? It can be uh, the both of them. Yeah. You're not ready to both of them, and both of them can ask. Uh, yeah, so my question is, um, I don't know if either one of them addressed it, like, through their debate, but who believes that they are men and who believes they're demons and is Joel too in relation to uh, Revelation 9? And that's my question. I'll go first. I believe the demons. My opponent believes they're human men and I do not believe that they're related to Joel in just in the sense of how the locusts are being described. I was correlating Joel because Joel describes them in the same manner how they look, how locusts look. That's it, bro. All right, Brother Gardner, you can answer and take off. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, I believe that they are actually the Roman army, and I do believe that the imagery indeed is pulled from Joel and talking about the same thing as Joel, uh, chapter 2. And uh, one of the significant things found in Joel, chapter 2, I'm just going to read the verses real fast, and then, then I'll mute up. This is, what's Joel, this is what happened in Joel chapter 2, uh, verse 30. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And I believe the great and terrible day of the Lord is found in the book of Revelation. They're talking about the same thing. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. We can find that as the woman actually escaping uh, into the wilderness. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, 
we see in the book of Revelation, the 144,000 standing with Christ in Mount Zion, and the Lord shall, and the, and, uh, and in Jerusalem shall be delivered, as the Lord has said, and in the remnant who the Lord shall call. So we find this being quoted as happening in Acts chapter 2, the first century, before the great and terrible day of the Lord. So what terrible and great of the Lord followed in Acts chapter 2? The Roman army coming in, destroying Jerusalem and the sanctuary. That followed. That happened after they received the Holy Spirit. So I believe definitely that's what Joel 2 was talking about. It's found in the book of Revelation. Yes, sir. Oh, thank you. All right. All right. Thank you, good sir. So it's our own brother, Makata. Brother Makata, you got the floor. I believe it's worth it. Oh, my goodness. I always mess up. I'm sorry, brother. I apologize, brother Makata. And I just, I think I just texted him today. <laughs> I'm going to reach out to you, brother. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question for the moderators first. First, shalom to everybody in the room, moderators. Shalom to Garden and Brother James. Um, is it okay if I read a scripture in six verses and then ask my question? Yeah. As long as it's, uh, who are you directing the question at, though? Uh, both, uh, both of them. Okay, go ahead. All right, this is uh, Revelation chapter 20, verse 1. Cause something came out during the uh, debate. And it wasn't stated clearly, so I want to uh, be brought up to uh, speed from the understanding of uh, Brother Garden and uh, James' position on this. This is Revelation 20 and 1, and it says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. That's pretty uh, specific. And cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed for a little season. And I saw thrones and they sat upon them and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God. And which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So my question is this, Brother uh, Garden, if you don't mind, can you answer this first? You skated over the thousand years. I want to know, just for edification purposes, at what point in history, first century, second century, whatever century it was, that this thousand years of Christ reigning, and as we see in contact, this is him reigning as king on the earth, because we all know that Christ is a king that hasn't reigned yet. When did this happen? And if you don't mind, also uh, let us know also um, at what point did this happen and the resurrection that this verse is actually pointing to as well. Thank you. I got you. Uh, let me unskate since I stated the word. My bad. I'm going to unskate. Um, first, uh, when you read Revelation 20, it never stated anything about being on earth. Uh, that was uh, added to it. Let me let me read it again. This is Revelation 20 and 4. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded. So we have dead people that John is looking at. I, have, I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God. And which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they live, they're dead, not everybody, just the dead. They live and reign with Christ a thousand years. Let me, let me say that again. According to verse 4, the people that was beheaded for the word of God, the souls of them that were beheaded and received the thrones, they lived and reign with Christ a thousand years. Revelation don't say everybody did it. And it doesn't say that everybody that, that was on planet Earth. So now, the question is now, can I show when that happened? 
So according to verse number five, this is the first resurrection. When these individuals that was beheaded, once they live again, this is the first resurrection. So what I do, I go to the prophets where the first resurrection occurred at, which is in Daniel chapter 12. And when I get done, I know this is kind of brought out, and I'm sorry, but this is the only way that I know how to answer it. So this is Daniel chapter 12, verse number 1 and 2. And then I have to go to Matthew, then I'll be done. I promise I'll be done. Daniel 12, 1. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble. I put that time of trouble when people was being killed for the testimony of Christ. So there should be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered at the time of trouble. Everyone is found written in the book and many of them to sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So I put that right there, verse 2, with the first resurrection, with according to verse 1, happens during the time period of a time of trouble since there was never a nation even to that same time. So what I do, I go to the Messiah. I go to Christ. Once again, sorry for the drawn out, but I'm almost done, I promise. I go to the Messiah now. And this is what the, the, the Messiah stated in Matthew 24. This is verse number 15. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whosoever read it, let him understand. Then let them which are in Judea uh, flee into the mountains. So during that time period, I'm going to take it to verse 21 now. For then shall be great tribulation. When is great tribulation? When the people are fleeing into the mountains after seeing the abomination of desolation. Then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to that time, nor, nor ever shall be. So that's got to be talking about what Daniel 12 is talking about. If it's not, Christ stated whatever happened then, it was going to be no greater tribulation than that. So I say Daniel 12 and 1 is what Matthew 24 and 21 is talking about. So according to Christ, this is happening during the time period that they're fleeing from the abomination of desolation. So Daniel 12 to me is when Rome comes in, because Luke 21 actually says when the all in Jerusalem is surrounded by armies, that's when uh, the desolation is near and you flee into the mountains. So I put this time period around the Roman army coming in to seize Jerusalem to bring in the curses. So your answer is when did that occur? I would say when Rome is getting ready to come in to exact vengeance for them killing the prophets. Yes. I will put that. Thank you. My bad for taking the long. No problem. Yeah, I'll just, can I go real quick? Yeah, you're in turn, James. Right. Uh, yeah, so the, I think he stated that, um, uh, that this thousand years is not on earth. Well, they must leave and come back because if you read two verses down, Revelation uh, 20 and 7, now when the thousand years that expired, Satan will be released from his prison. And verse 8, and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for the together to battle for whose number is as the sand of the sea. And verse 9 says, they went upon up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the love city fire came down from God out of heaven. So right here in verse 9, we see the day after the thousand year reign, the Satan goes out to deceive these literal people that are left on the earth because they come up on the breath of the earth. So that's, a, that's the way I see it. And this thousand years is, like I said, has not happened yet. The uh, This exodus coincides with the second coming of Jesus Christ, literally the second coming. That's all I got. All right, it looks like it has concluded. It has concluded, Brother Josh. Here, I think we're going to get into the uh, what as far as the determination on whom the judges believe. As far as one, it's going to be fair. We're going to get the side. We're going to get Brother Garden's three moderator side, as well as three mods. One, the brother, uh, looks like the Brother James side as well. That way, we can, you know, we're going to come to a conclusion on whom they think won the debate. Me being the host, 
I got the easy job, meaning I don't have to say. So I'm going to leave this to the brothers as far as those who have to make that decision. Brother Josh, you here? Yeah, I'm right here. Uh, <clears throat> are we going to do it like their side goes first, like one, two, three, or is it like one of them say, then one of us say, then one of them say, how are we going to do this? I, I, well, I, would say, I, yeah, I would say one of them, one of, uh, you know, one of us, or one of y'all, and then one of them, one of us. You know, that's what I would say. Just to be fair and everything. Even though I think it'll still be the same thing, so. Right, right, right. Um, one of them can go first if they want to. On their side, one of their judges can explain why. Any one of y'all want to go first? Brother, anybody on Brother Garden's side want to go first or whom they think want to debate and why they think one of the you can say you think one and why you think one to debate? And, you know. And we want to move to the next brother. brother. Uh, yeah, so I, I have uh, I have uh, Brother Garden uh, winning the debate. Um, I just don't think that uh, Brother James did a satisfactory job in um, showing that the the locusts are in fact uh, demons there. And I, I think the the biggest factor was um, not only going to the Book of Enoch but also uh, Joel, and um, I, th I think that the, the considering, the, the considerate um, amount of information that was brought out uh, showing that Joel was uh, describing a literal uh, army. Um,